My name is John Patrick. Um, real privilege actually and honour to be here and also work with the team. Um, I've been involved with the programme now since about 2019 and it's been you know, phenomenal, phenomenal. So what I want to talk about is, is Chromosat uh, and the ambitions of what we're trying to do with the Chromosat program. Um, program. So it became evident as we set out on this journey. You know, I'm, I'm from the space industry, I'm, I'm in Tokyo and I'm actually quite um, but, um, you know, working within the space industry, it's for the front of the people, it's very inspirational, but it's very interesting, it's for the seniors, um, and it's now sort of a real crap, and telling people about space and computer space. And, um, and, um, and, and as we set out on this journey, it became, you know, really evident that there was this lack of understanding, we had two problems actually. We had a lack of understanding of just how important space was and how integrated space is into our day to day lives. Um, as Mal said, we, we, um, um, yeah. we, we went through this process with Council shortly after the climate emergency and um, we had a, um, a, a lot of opposition for the likes of Extinction Rebellion. And, and a lot of the feedback we were getting was why bother? What's the importance of space? Why are we bothering with spacecraft? Um, why call them as they sit there on their mobile phones, as they drove down from um, as they drove down from London using their satellite you know, using the satellite allocation. So a complete lack of awareness of just how space fits within our day-to-day -day lives. So you think, well that's a problem, we've got to do something about that. So so that was issue number one. Issue number two, and this actually goes back and it's close to my heart. Um, why did I join the space industry in the first place? I was a bit of a reprobate. I could have got two ways um, when I was at school. It would have been more very pretty than where I am now. Um, and, and it's because I found that a company called SSTL came to the college and says, I'm looking to, to do space, I'm looking to do space differently. I thought, wow, you know, there's this traditional way of doing space and there's, there's doing things differently. But I can relate like, to that. But when we come close to the home and we look at Cornwall, you know, we've got a lot of school children, we've got a lot of college children, and, and two of the issues we have are inspiration and aspiration. You know, if, if you talk to a lot of school children and you say, have you thought about a career in science or in engineering, they go, not in Cornwall, no. You know, if I want to go into any of those professions, I have to leave Cornwall. And you go, but you don't. But there are these, these perceptions that, that this is this industry here. And it's not just the children, it's the parents. The children, you know, you might talk to the children, and the children go home and go, Dad, I'm going to be a scientist. And the father goes, don't be so stupid, son. Go and get a job in a restaurant, or go and get a job in tourism. And so we've got two challenges, in addition to the environmental elements that Mel was talking about. We thought, we've got to do something about both of those. And so, so let's say, Mel had this, this great child about the Kermes, and the Kermes had one tip. Well, we could, we could look at uh, climate-related activities, we could maybe charge and, and take a levy that goes into sort of party or we could look at doing things differently. So we said, okay, why don't we actually look at putting in place a program to build, to develop and build community spacecraft and residence needs. And that was very much the genesis of the of program. And you go, well, where do we start? Um, because actually, space touches so many different things. Um, and one thing of obviously the problem is we're surrounded by perhaps and there's so many coastal related challenges and problems that, that we need to look at address. So so we thought well actually let's start with a marine environmental monitoring mission. So why don't we put up a small spacecraft and use that to monitor and observe the, the, the ocean health. Um, and there's a number of groups and a number of people that you're going to hear from today who all have applications related to that that we can put in using and addressing such a satellite. So, Kernosat 1 is, a, is, is specifically aimed at addressing the environmental monitoring um, application. I look at this as the first step, and this is not the first step of what the space team is doing, but this is the first step on what we hope the community is going to do and move forward with. So, it's not just our idea. I look at it as sort of the, the, the snowball um, uh, effect. You, 
you start off with an idea, it's quite small, you get it out into the community, it starts to grow momentum, and what does success look like? And five, six years from now, loads of different people looking at different programs and missions, all tackling different aspects of, of climate change or environment, or even other applications. So Cornwall, very modest, small step. Now I know a uh, girl pointed out, she said to me earlier, she said, Kerno say is a bit contentious. <laughs> Because we've got the academic term, well, this is some fidelity science. Now, this first step is targeted at the school children, the college children, and some of the universities. It's not about fidelity yeah. science, it's about that initial catalyst. We've got um, um, commercial entities going, well, I'd love to be involved in the Kerner program. Great, let's get on with it. Let's pick up some of those applications and actually run with them. Let's see how together we can go out and raise funding to put some of those programs into place. So Kerno said, the first one is all about marine um, environmental monitoring. So what we're talking about here is a small spacecraft, and, and when I talk about small spacecraft, I'm meaning this sort of size, so it's, it's just a little cute set. And that's going to be put into low Earth orbit on the launcher one, so Virgin orbit launcher one, taking off out of um, nuclear airport, or spaceport Cornwall, um, summer this year. And that would be in orbit, collecting data from small instrumented buoys in the ocean. Um, and so we're not talking about huge spacecraft, you know, the, the advances, we're leveraging the advances in technology. So whereas in the past, spacecraft were multi hundred million, you know, it took 10, 15 years to build. Now you're talking about spacecraft of the size of a small shoebox and costing 100 to 200,000 in, in cost and thereabouts. So, so a, a, a very different approach to the different approach. This spacecraft will be launched and delivered into low Earth orbit, so it's about 500 kilometers in height, be whizzing around the world um, every 90 minutes or so. And as that satellite transits over Cornwall, it will be collecting data from buoys and instrument packages through the ocean. It will be uploaded into the spacecraft and then we'll be downloading them as we transit over New Guinea, for example. And then that data will then make its way out into the community. So I'm going to leave it there and I'll come back to a little bit about the boys in a minute. But before I do that, I'm going to hand over to Heidi and she'll talk a bit about the sort of inspiration and engagement. Great, thanks so much, John. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Heidi. I'm the project manager of the Cornwall Space and Aerospace Energy Training Programme. Um, we're one of these marvellous EU funded programmes, just one of the last, that is based at Truro College. Um, not surprisingly, in mean, Truro, tell people about the benefits of life, uh, of satellites to life on Earth, and how actually space is something that they can be involved in. Space is a career that they can take in Cornwall. So, as John said, many young people said they think they have to leave Cornwall. I actually was uh, raised in Devon, and I left Devon because there was nothing um, spacey, and I found my way back down to South West, and I'm very happy with that. So, where does Kermesat fit into all of the things that we're doing and how is Kermesat actually benefiting the local community in terms of education, outreach and public engagement? Well, as we've heard, Kermesat is this commission which is absolutely fantastic. It's kind of this, this aim to almost entirely design and build and launch a satellite from the William Hall. And I think a few years ago, none of us would have thought that that was a reality. So this will be everything from the design of our factory to the comms, the data analysis, and that kind of public engagement and outreach piece. Um, and I think where Kermis at One has really excelled so far since it was kind of launched, or the, the program was launched in June last year, it's only been going a few months, but there's been two main parts that have really had impact so far. And the first is around developing awareness of the benefits of space. So as Mel John said, so many people just don't understand how space impacts every single one of us every single day. You get up and you have your cornflakes, and by the time you've had your cornflakes, you've probably used the space in about 10 different ways in some way, whether it's the farm or going across the field, or whether it's kind of getting the GPS uh, to get the cornflakes to your door. Um, but that's absolutely fantastic, it's a great program so far. There's also developing the awareness of the opportunities in space, and that's where Kermit says being excited, so I'll touch on them in a second. So I think that awareness is great. It's, it's nice to have awareness, everyone feels very happy and warm about it. But I think what's even better is the actual real impacts. And I think since the program started, there's been some real impacts in Cornwall that are measurable and tangible, and things that actually you see young people are picking up on every single day. So 
the first of all is around some skills development piece um, that, that is educating people and getting people these real skills. So there's this demand from industry that space for and Kerner site is showing the high tech jobs, the high wage, high growth, and it's in a sector that's exciting and growing and moving. People can actually be employed here. It's showing us as educators that there's pathways for our students to follow. We don't have to tell them to go our country to go and go to university or get a job. They can do something right here in Cornwall and they can go and visit real businesses and do work experience at real places in Cornwall which provide them the skills. Um, and some of these real benefits have been in the fact that we've had at Trove College and other educators around Cornwall have had so many great interactions with the Kermit Stack team and the Space Force team so far. So some of those have been the fact that we've had students, apprentices and A-level students and HMC students, that really great mix of vocational and traditional qualifications. They've been working together to actually submit a design to the UK's NanoSAC competition. They've worked with Dave, who has had a baby, so he's not here today, of course. Other lockdown baby, and um, worked with working with John, and actually they used the apprentice's experience as apprentice at Teagle, a local farming manufacturing company, to think about how sustainability can be really embedded in farming. So they came up with this idea of how to put sensors in the ground, a little bit like the kind of sat inspiration of using sensors in the sea to com communicate with satellites and improve practices of farming. And that's all kind of fed into the boy who's working at a farming manufacturing site. That's fantastic, and that never would have happened before. We've also got kind of challenges around that data analytics and that coding, that downstream part of the sector. Tomorrow, we're going to be back here again with a group of students. So we're bussing in a bunch of our students who are coming to do coding challenges and hacking and working out how to use data in real life ways with Kermit's Act. So they're going to use all their skills that they've learned in school, combine them with real life experience, and actually, that's going to be fantastic. And there's also been real employment opportunities already. So I don't know if anyone here has heard of Space Placements and Industry Programme, but if not, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's a programme which is set up by the Catapult and UK Space Agency to give university students the opportunity to spend eight weeks in a company working in real space problems. Um, as a quick plug, please check it out now, I'm very excited before I go for it. But Space Board team has had students employed and working on their Kernis Act program already. So the fact that they have already brought inspiration through this kind of wide outreach public engagement program, they brought real skills development from students working with the Space Board Kernis Act team, and they've brought um, employment already, and that's fantastic. It's exactly what we all need. Um, so, that's only been going since June. There's been these fantastic exhibits, and it's already reached the very youngest who get to go and interact with the real rocket and have that kind of wow moment as they get to stand in front of this massive thing that's about 100 times bigger than they are and go, that's going to be launching from down the road soon. You get kids that get a chance to film TV because of space for cool. That's amazing. Imagine being on TV as a kid. I mean, yeah, that's me. Mum, look at me. That's fantastic. Um, we're setting up a space camp where we're going to be having kids come in, go visit rockets, get involved in challenges, build their own rockets all because of the things that Kermit Sack and Spaceport is doing. And we've got students applying their skills in national and local competitions like the UK NanoSat competition, like this hackathon tomorrow, so they can actually use the skills they've learned. So, without trying to sound too cheesy, um, I think Kermit Sack and the Spaceport team have done an amazing job so far at making that transition from just inspiration to real engagement and real impact in the community. Um, I'm going to leave it there, but if you do want to get in touch, it's fine later, I'll be around. Thanks, Heidi. And um, it is very much a team job, and um, the, the group that we're working with at the college was phenomenal. And it's, it's great to see just what happened in such a short period of time, from just this idea early in the year to picking up and the team at the college now have a chance to have, um, um, so the, the, the space agency has put a fund together to fund a number of those ideas that were successful, so fingers crossed on that. But basically it was, it was their idea, you know, they picked up on this, they, they picked up on what we we're trying to do with Granadzat and they said, I can apply this to farming. You know? and, and, and that's the key thing, it needs to be people's ideas, they need to buy into it, they need to run with it. And the team phenomenal, so I think the team have done a great job. 
So that's 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 that, and and um, that was a good plug on the spin program. So I'll just touch on that very briefly because that's been phenomenal as well. So this is the space agency makes a small amount of funding available to support students on, a, on an eight week internship over the summer. Um, I would encourage any organisation out there that is interested or think they may have an interest in space related activities, whether that's upstream the building of hardware or downstream the applications and services. Um, and, and if you're worried about the daunting forms of things, then just let me know because I'm all for trying to just help you know, get some of those um, um, students into jobs. We had three great ones over the summer. So, so now we can sort of move over to some of the action applications and services because again, we're putting up a spacecraft that enables us to measure and monitor a number of different things. So we're going to talk to Luis now and he's going to go through um, some of their interests. Thank you. I'm brand new here, as a matter of fact, you can tell from the accent that I'm not from this area. I arrived to Hong Kong about a month and a half ago, so I have no idea what this whole thing is about. Uh, and I'm also working with wildlife, uh, marine wildlife, so I work with charismatic mega farmers and flock of things that most people want to have here, you shouldn't compare to be neighbors. Um, so what am I doing here? Well, think about how, do you, how can you tell where a whale goes? You can only try to fall onto their tail, but there's nothing you can do to actually find out where they go. So for wildlife monitoring, it was a really uh, a dramatic um, in, innovation in the field, the fact that we started counting on satellites to see where the animals go. So this, the idea of this was to try to understand beyond what the animals go, beyond where a whale or a seal or a seabird goes in the, in the planet. The idea is, what can we learn about the environment and the things that are using based on their movement and what we call habitat utilization patterns? So this plot is basically an idea of what we're trying to come up All In particular, the examples that I'm going to be talking about are based in uh, Antarctica, we just I just moved here. So I haven't started my research for in the area, but the idea would be to start doing something similar on a smaller scale to what I'm going to be presenting. Oh, it's moving. So I'm going to talk about a project that combined efforts from uh, about 70 different countries where we put instruments on animals from the Southern Ocean. So these are, this is an animation of the movement of one year in the life of predators in the southern oceans. You can see a target in there, and you can see how hopefully the movement of these animals moving all over the southern ocean. The reason why we can tell this is because every single one of these instruments that we put on an animal is talking to a satellite system that is going around the planet, and we can try to take location of these animals. So that way we can understand better their movement patterns. But it does begin the movement pattern. We also want to understand how the system is working and what kind of uh, variables are explaining their presence and their absence in the ecosystem. We cannot tell how things are going to impact the ecosystem, for example, unless we have proxies that is going to tell us, well, we think the habitat is going to shift. So, on one hand, we have the satellite, the benefit of the satellite is to track animals and understand how they're moving, but also we use the satellite to provide environmental data at the scales that are necessary to understand how these animals are moving in the ocean. You, you can use oceanographic vessels, for example, and go to the southern ocean and go and take a cruise, but it's going to take a long time to actually get us an optic view of the, of the entire planet. Satellites have allowed us to measure a series of variables that we can use as proxies and then build statistical models to uh, relate the, those variables to the presence or, presence or absence of, of animals in particular. So these plots, for example, what I'm showing you here, are the one on the top left is just the number of seals and species that don't pay too much attention. But the top right, for example, is bathymetry. What's the depth of the water column in a particular part of the ocean? And that's measured through satellites. The one on the bottom left is perfect content, the productivity, how much plants basically are being are, are available for the entire traffic web in that particular area. And you can also see in that same image the eyes, which is a very important parameter and as you, you can tell is a vital uh, part of the ecosystem in those highlighted uh, uh, areas. And then the one on the bottom right is sea surface temperature, one of the easiest variables to measure from satellites and it's a, it has a huge impact on where the animals occur. 
So combining all these data that we get gathered from satellite, all this environmental data, with the movement data, we can build statistical models that allow us to predict the occurrence of animals, the occurrence of aggregations of animals, and understand what we call the location of areas of ecological significance. The premise behind this is that if the animals are going to one particular area, it's because there's something in there that they want. And obviously, in this case, it's food. So if we want to protect the ocean, we want to understand how things are going to be changing with the impact of climate change, we can, we can see how well our network of very protected areas is going to be working um, in the future. So we build this set of these models that tell us we, we can predict the presence of predators right now, which are those white countries you can see in there, and then run our statistical models under different scenarios for climate change in the future. And that way we can see how those are, might shift in the future or not. Uh, the uh, orange and pink areas, the orange are current very protected areas in the ocean, and you can see how some of them actually do overlap with the presence of these areas where predators occur. And the pink is the proposed location of very protected areas that's going to happen in the future. So by doing these kind of simulations that we um, can uh, that we base in satellite data, we can understand now how well those marine protected areas are going to be working in the future and the different uh, scenarios of climate change, whether they're going to be good or the protection is going to actually decrease, and how that might affect the entire ecosystem. The final part that I wanted to mention today was the fact that, as I was telling, is beyond just knowledge about this the animal. We can use the animals to, to also do a lot of data collection for ourselves. But if, as you can imagine, it would be really hard to send a whale in the middle of the ocean, get some data about the, the structure of the water column, and recover that data unless we have the satellites. So we've been pushing together with our community the idea of using animals as monitor, monitors of the ocean, as oceanographers. And we now have the technology to deploy a, a, an instrument that is about the size of your cell phone on animals, on elephant seeds, for example, or whales, that is not only telling me the location, it's actually measuring temperature, salinity of the water column, the chlorophyll content, oxygen, etc. All those variables are very important to understand how the marine system is changing. And the way to get those data back from them is because all these instruments are talking to the satellite systems of, of, that are flying up, uh, above them. So we can easily get all this data on real time from animals via satellite and then use those data to understand how we as humanity are impacting the marine ecosystems. So that's the last talk that I wanted, the last piece of data that I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I just love the fact that, you know, just what people can dream up and how they use satellites to do different things. Um, I'm just going to just touch upon some work that we're doing with one of our partners on the boys, so the sort of the instrumentation. So when we started, um, say, we, we thought about the idea of a Chemosat program, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to um, some of the other applications of that in a minute, but we said we focus very much on the marine environmental aspects. And there's many, many things we can be doing, and that's another project we're looking at over the next coming years. Um, when we first started the idea of Kronosat, the idea was um, basically to put up a small satellite with an ocean monitoring camera. Um, but the problem is with a small spacecraft that's the size of a shoebox with a small imaging payload on, very difficult to get a lot of people actively involved in, in the building of that. So we thought, well, is there a different way, is there a different approach of, of, of expanding this to get more of a community engagement into the program? And so we actually morphed the program slightly and said, well, actually, rather than putting the, the instrumentation on the spacecraft, why don't we put the instrumentation in the ocean? And why don't we just have a very simple spacecraft to connect the data in the ocean? And then actually that opens it up to enable us to deploy instrumentation to address a range of different applications. And so then, it's not up to us to define what this thing does. It's up to the community and their community's the imagination to figure out what they want to do and what they want to make as of interest. To then find a way to package that up to get up to the space and down in it. And so, so that was the, the way that it worked. Um, and so 
we basically said, okay, so we'll, rather, than, rather than observing from above, we will connect. So we'll do in situ measurements. And so the idea being that we can use boys or we can use boats uh, and put the instrumentation on the data and then use the satellite to collect the data as the satellite comes overhead. Now, as, as Mel was talking about earlier, one of the, one of the issues with the, the space industry is the past has been to be very insular, very protective, it's all about the IP. I come from a slightly different direction, and one of the programs we're doing is that there's no open source satellite program. Can we make the space flight accessible? And the same applies to if we come up with an open source boy design that actually anybody can make. Any of the, the schools and the colleges can build, and we're working with Kuro and with that as well, so that we can actually get them out into the community and get people coming up with their own ideas. And so, with these boys and the Kuro Sat 1, we'll be able to measure a whole range of different things. Whether that is wave height or ocean clarity, or whether it is it's water party counts, etc. So there's a whole range of different things that we can be that we can be measuring with this spacecraft using these boys. And so, so here's a good example of a, of a very small boy. Um, so this is actually a, an open source design. Um, there's a, a, a young lady who wrote a blog about small boys. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we begin to be using tomorrow in tomorrow's hackathon session. Um, look at how we can put some really available pieces of equipment together to measure things of interest. And so the team that are going to be there are going to be talking about those. We're working with a group called Lacuna. So they're another group that are looking at basically developing these small terminals for measuring things of interest. So whether that is the marine environment or agriculture or other matters. So, so this gives us a platform that we can then use and build upon to measure a whole range of different things. So now I'm going to hand over um, and talk about it. Sorry, it's not Good morning, everyone. Sorry, um, so I'm working with a, a group of other scientists and collaborators uh, with a project called Blue Green Coast. So uh, myself and my colleague over there, Tom, give us a wave with Coastal Crusaders. So we've had this project working with Kermit Sat. So what I want to do is give a bit of context to behind the project that we have. So thinking about ocean restoration. Now, if we think of a planet, 30% of it is land, of course. Increasing human populations, within 30 years from now, there's going to be about 10 billion people on the planet. So if we think of ecosystem services, habitat utilisation, exploitation, that's going to increase, isn't it? And those ecosystem services have a value, okay? And we're losing those through agriculture, habitat fragmentation, all those different things. And we've gone from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, which is the sixth mass extinction, of course. But I don't want to instill ecological grief because there are some positives at the end of this. So the increasing demand is increasing. Now, in actual fact, in the last 50 years, we've lost 50% of our ecosystem services. So we carry on at the same rate of loss. Those ecosystems will become functionally extinct. So what we need to do is reverse that, which is why we're all here today, of course. So looking to the land for mitigation of climate change, for example, is a little bit unlikely with the increase in humans, of course, increase in human population, increase in demand of those ecosystem services. So let's have a look at 70% of our planet, which is ocean, of course, uninhabited by humans, mostly, and so the likelihood of restoring those lost ecosystems is going to be fantastic, of course. And in actual fact, what we have there is a wealth of carbon-rich ecosystems. Now, if we were to think about a league table of carbon-rich ecosystems, top of the list would be peat bogs. Second down from that, in the Premier League of Carbon Dynamics, would be mangrove forests. Those are tropical ecosystems, of course, but more temperately, we have seagrass beds, we have salt marsh, we have kelp forests. And so what we need to do is pull our carbon emitting belt in, don't we become carbon absorbing society? And already we're at 1.8 planets worth of resources. Remember, we talked about loss of ecosystem services, so we're almost at two planets worth of utilisation of our habitat resources. 
So we need to become more efficient at what we do. So let's look about ecological disruption. Let's think about our coastal carbon rich ecosystems. So we have sea grasses. Many people just think, oh, we don't need them, they're just bits of grass in water, they're not important. But in actual fact, they're very important for connectivity. Connectivity of energy from the coast going out to the open oceans, they drive biodiversity, they drive fisheries, they draw down carbon. CO2 from the atmosphere, those greenhouse gases, they lock them away in the sediment, so they're really important. So we're losing sea grasses, we're losing salt marsh. Kelp forests. If we carry at the same rate of loss by the end of the century, we'll have zero kelp forest left in the UK. Now we're going to talk about their significance in a minute. Now, crucial carbon six, globally, sea grasses will have top end value about 120 tonnes of carbon in a size of about a football pitch. Salt marsh about 75 tonnes of carbon. Kelp will actually produce what we call a carbon conveyor. So it doesn't store the carbon in situ. What it does, it transports that carbon to adjacent ecosystems, so acts as a carbon conveyor. So there are significant carbon stores elsewhere. Now that carbon in the sea grass, salt marsh, and kelp forest is locked away for a very long time, for a millennia. So that carbon's taken out of the atmosphere, drawn down, so they're carbon sponges. These ecosystems will draw down carbon 20 to 30 times faster than terrestrial plants, so they're very efficient doing that. They reduce coastal erosion, so rather than spend millions of pounds for storm defences, nature-based solutions will do that for us. They're very good at doing that. They stop coastal erosion, stop shoreline drift. They have a direct link to biodiversity. The structure of the ecosystem, driving nursery grounds and spawning grounds for many commercially important fish species. It's a vitally important course. So for local communities, Fishermen, businesses, it's all dependent upon carbon rich coastal ecosystems. So, what do we want to do then with Coastal Crusaders, University of Portsmouth, and other universities? We have a very ambitious project that we're developing, working with Kern and SAT. So, we have science and research based innovative projects. I dare say blue sky thinking, I won't do that. Okay, but I'm a applied ecologist, so I get my hands dirty. Most of the time I'm in tropical ecosystems, up to my waist in mangrove mud, so I do get in there and count stuff and measure stuff. One of the most important things for being a scientist, in actual fact this is a missing skill for many scientists, is communication. Bridging the gap between the science and the general public. If you can't do that, what's the point of all of this? Because if the general public don't know, you don't have that mass and that that movement to create something positive. So it's very important for outreach, education. Environmental health, of course. So we're talking about mitigation of climate change. We're talking about water quality, improving all of those things with carbon-rich ecosystems in our coastal waters. So fishery biodiversity with the nursery function, the habitat structure driving that flow of energy and driving the functions of coastal ecosystems. Blue carbon, terrestrial carbon could be deemed as or termed as green carbon. Blue carbon, carbon sequestered in the oceans. So we're talking about carbon sinks as well. So we want to significantly improve those carbon sinks. Climate change mitigation, drawing down CO2 gases, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, locking them away for a long time, of course. Restoration. We're going to restore lost habitats. Of course, that's going to improve the carbon stores, that's going to improve the biodiversity, it's going to improve those ecosystem services, there's lots of ecosystem services, and it's going to increase the value of those habitats, particularly for the local community we depend upon. It's going to improve water quality. So the research plan, working with Kernosat, we want to enhance and map the blue carbon-rich coastal ecosystem. Okay, using the satellites. Then we'll do some ground truthing surveys as well. We're going to measure the carbon slots, the above ground and the, be the below ground carbon biomass. This will then give a value to those carbon slots. 
We're going to look at the kelp derived carbon stocks. So some fancy science involved in that, looking at stable isotope analysis, looking at eDNA, so we can establish where those vast kelp carbon stores actually are in the deep ocean trenches. We're going to do some biodiversity monitoring. So look at the value of those juvenile spawning areas. Look at the value of those now. Okay. Then we're going to look at historical images. We're going to take it back. Look at those historical images thinking, well, okay, this is called the shifting baseline syndrome. Your mum would have said, your dad would have said, ah, years ago you should have seen the seagrass beds in the kelp forest 30 years ago. But their parents would have said, you should have seen it 30 years ago, and so on. So if you peel it back, you're going to have ecosystems using satellite imagery with this much area. You go forward in time, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what we can do, utilising the ground truth data from the real data, real-time data satellite imagery, we can actually apply the value loss over time of what we lost using regression analysis, using fancy stats and things like that. So we want to implement strategic restoration plans in certain areas, utilising these satellite imagery so we can plant seagrasses, we can restore salt marshes, we can restore kelp forests back in the areas where we lost them, drawing down that carbon. We can set up sensors. We've just been talking about in those buoys, drawing down information from the water column, looking at biodiversity, looking at temperature of the water to assess climate change variation between the seasons, looking at pH, so how acidic are our oceans. Natural facts, if you improve not just one ecosystem, if you look at the whole jigsaw puzzle, so salt marsh, seagrass, and kelp forest, you increase ecosystem robustness. You increase ecosystem longevity, ecosystem health, of course. And of course, you improve and mitigate the impacts from climate change. We can look at dissolved oxygen levels, how healthy are our water quality there, and look at nitrates and phosphates again, looking at eutrophication, how we can mitigate those things. And also look at turbidity as well. So the whole sort of depth and wealth of different things that we're going to be monitoring, working in conjunction with Portland University, with Coastal Crusades and Kern, etc. So there's our project. And we're going to be bringing that tomorrow to the hackathon as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. So. We talked about KernoSat, KernoSat 1 for marine environment. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, actually the way that we look at KernoSat is as a program, as a framework. So what we're really interested in is really stimulating the community to look at what else we can be doing in the future. And not what else can the space Walk team be doing in the future, but what else can we be doing as a community. And whether that is um, climate environmental monitoring, or whether it's harsh environmental research, or whether it's you know, space resort, space, um, uh, space utilisation, etc. There's a whole range of things that we can be doing um, um, locally to address local needs. Um, and it doesn't need to be one programme. Say, for me, it's about a number of programmes um, 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 spanning over to the future, which will really bring space down to down to form. Last part, really, for the hackathon tomorrow. So if any of you have... Um, 17 to 21 year olds who are interested in coming to have um, um, uh, been involved in tomorrow's activity. We've still got a few places, so by all means, come along. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'd like to thank the team uh, for their presentations. I hope that's going to be a bit of an insight into what we're looking to do with Kernosan. So thank you.